Greetings, I'm Michael Quinn Patton. This is a video unlike any that I've known to be done in evaluation. I've long wanted to do it, to do a riff, a stream of consciousness, an explosion about the role of concepts in evaluation, being a conceptually driven, conceptually based field. This is my riff on the role of concepts in our thinking, in our work, in our profession, in our lives. Greetings, I'm Michael Quinn Patton. This video is going to examine the conceptual foundations of the field of evaluation. We think of evaluation as methodologically driven, but it is no less conceptually driven. Indeed, I'm going to argue that it is more conceptually based than methodologically based because even our methods are conceptual in nature. Our theories are based upon concepts. Our practices are based upon conceptual options. Our methods are dependent on conceptual distinctions. The word concept comes from the medieval Latin conceptum, meaning a thing conceived or grasped or taken hold of. Concepts are what we use to make sense of the world, to make distinctions. I did an article for the American Journal of Evaluation looking at what brain sciences reveal about integrating theory and practice and focused on the ways in which we take in information through conceptual screens. We are programmed in our brains to think conceptually. The very first volume of New Directions for Evaluation, published in 1978, and the first article in that volume was about a key concept, Needs Assessment, by Michael Scriven and Jane Roth. And in that same first edition of New Directions, James C. Stone deconstructed the word evaluation to look at the core nature of values in the act of making judgments. Conceptual distinctions are all around us. Time versus space, stars versus planets, oceans versus continents, consciousness versus unconsciousness. And so the importance of concepts, conceptual distinctions is a part of how we explore options in evaluation qualitative methods versus quantitative methods versus mixed methods are methodological distinctions for making choices about how we go about what we do. And so in this video, I'm going to look at and build on a long tradition of examining the conceptual foundations of our field. In 1987, volume of New Directions, Chuck McClintock, looked at the conceptual and action heuristics that evaluators use in making decisions. Heuristics are the shortcuts that we use. They're the rules of thumb. They're the ways that we sort through all the hundreds of options to figure out what should I do in this case. And those heuristics are conceptually based. In 1997, Blaine Worthen, is the editor of Evaluation Practice, the precursor journal of the American Journal of Evaluation, devoted his editorial to exploring and clarifying important evaluation concepts and practices, kind of endeavor that has characterized the evaluation field from its very beginnings, as is true of all disciplines and practice fields. Throughout this video, I'll be inviting you to consider the following kinds of questions. What core concepts undergird your approach? What conceptual frameworks inform your practice? What conceptual distinctions do you offer to those with whom you work? What concepts are important to the stakeholders you engage with? And what concepts are not part of your thinking, but perhaps should be so? As you've already noticed, I'll be drawing upon the history of the field of evaluation. I've been doing this work for more than 50 years now and believe that it's critical for both old timers and newcomers to evaluation to understand how our field has developed conceptually and to examine the concepts historically and now and into the future that are going to frame 
how we think about evaluation, which affects how we practice evaluation, which determine our theories of evaluation. An example of that historical presence being the work of Rodney Hobson, a president of the American Evaluation Association in 2012, and one of the leaders in culturally responsive evaluation, who edited a, an issue of New Directions for Evaluation in 2000 on how and why language matters in evaluation. Concepts are the fundamentals of that language, and that's what we're going to be dealing with as we go along. Concepts are the building blocks of theory. Evaluation theories begin as concepts, like the concept of evaluation use. The concept becomes a conceptual framework, which becomes an approach, which becomes an evaluation theory. For example, utilization-focused evaluation. But it all begins with a concept. Concepts lead to priority evaluation questions, which lead to designs, methods, and measurements. But again, it starts with the concept. So we're going to do a whirlwind tour of influential concepts and conceptual frameworks, beginning with the original evaluand circle of five Ps, a conceptual framework concerning what's being evaluated, programs, policies, personnel, product, or project, distinct what we call evaluands, and to, we've now added systems to that typology. Evaluation comes as M&E, distinguishing monitoring from evaluation, which has morphed into MEL, monitoring, evaluation, and learning. Here are some classic conceptual typologies. Bloom's taxonomy, which are different levels of learning from remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating, used to evaluate learning in schools. Maslow's hierarchy or pyramid are different levels of human needs conceptualized and used as ways of identifying the level at which interventions are occurring and the results are occurring. Women's ways of knowing emerged as five stages of knowing that could serve to evaluate the level of women's engagement and empowerment in various programs. Here are some early evaluation conceptual distinctions that have endured. Scriven's distinction between formative and summative evaluation that first was articulated in 1967. Stufflebeam's classic conceptual framework on the SIP model distinguished context, input, process, and product. Bob Stake's responsive evaluation, which became culturally responsive evaluation and utilization-focused evaluation, which is based upon two fundamental concepts of primary intended users and primary intended uses. Having those options presented to primary intended users became the overarching principle of utilization-focused evaluation to focus on intended use by and with intended users in every aspect of and at every stage of an evaluation. As evaluators conceptualized utilization, different ways of talking about use emerged and was debated. Use, utility, useful, utilization. We began to distinguish findings use from process use, where process use is what's learned by people engaged in the evaluation and the impacts of being involved in evaluation as opposed to the impact of applying findings. Carol Weiss, one of our great pioneers, distinguished utility tests from truth tests or accuracy and noted that evaluation's credibility was dependent on both being useful and being accurate or conveying what she called truth. And that led us into thinking about evaluation's impacts in many ways. What are the outcomes of an evaluation that are used? What are the results of using evaluation? That led to conceptualizations beyond use of influence, of illumination, of consequences that go beyond direct use. Politically 
uses, like what came to be distinguished as symbolic use, where the findings are not really being used for action, but give the appearance uh, for political purposes of having been evaluation. Uh, legitimative use occurs when evaluation findings are used to support a decision that was already made. Persuasive reuse refers to using evaluation findings to support a position uh, for political or funding purposes. Imposed use occurs when those with power to do so mandate a particular form of evaluation use. For example, when a higher authority requires a prescribed use by those at a lower level. For example, a federal requirement that to receive funding the school district curriculum must be approved on a list of evidence-based or evaluated programs. And then mechanical or mechanistic or compliance use refers to simply going through the motions to meet an evaluation requirement. The evo evaluation is required, so it is done, but the motivation is compliance and the implementation is mechanical or mechanistic. And then we got into misuse. Mischievous misuse it includes calculated and intentional suppression, misrepresentation, or unbalanced use. Inadvertent misuse or mistaken misuse occurs uh, when findings lack the background uh, or competence to be used. Overuse occurs when too much emphasis is placed on evaluation findings. And then that led to thinking about non-use, non-use due to misevaluation. There are times when evaluation shouldn't be used because it's not well done. Political non-use occurs when findings are ignored because they conflict with ideological values. Aggressive non-use or calculated resistance refers to situations where an evaluation or evaluator is attacked and use is undermined because the results conflict with or raise questions about a preferred position. And then there are unintended evaluation effects that can include any range of ways that the evaluation has an impact upon a program but that were not planned or foreseeable. What you see here is the way in which as a field of inquiry emerges, in this case utilization, going more deeply into the multiple dimensions of that field uh, give rise to different conceptualizations of how to think about what's going on. And so as a field of inquiry develops, as in utilization, we generate a set of factors that fit together in a complex dynamic evaluation system. In this case, the nature of the thing being evaluated, who the stakeholders and users are, what the characteristics of the evaluator are, what the situation and context are, the purposes and uses intended for the evaluation, and the methods and processes that are used, and that these interact to define an evaluation situation and determine how the evaluation is used, both the findings and the process impact. Here are some other evaluation conceptual frameworks. Kirkpatrick's training evaluation model has four levels to evaluate training, from satisfaction to learning to impact to results. Claude Bennett's evidence hierarchy for cooperative extension had seven levels, from the inputs to activities, people's involvement, reactions, the knowledge, attitudes, and skills change, behavior change, and the ultimate results and impact. And he created examples of hard and soft evidence for each one of these levels of impact, which was a precursor of logic models and logical frameworks. Levels of evidence hierarchies have existed over time that rate different kinds of evidence uh, and their utility. We have SMART goals, which conceptualize goals as specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time frame. This is a conceptualization of high quality goals. A complete matrix of the logical framework created a way to look at the things that go on in an evaluation from evaluating activities to results, purpose, and goals, and the different kinds of indicators that are used. All of which, at a simplified level, became the basic logic model that we still know and use today. But against that backdrop, systems concepts were introduced. Bob Williams and Iraq Imam 
came out in 2007 with the Systems Concepts and Evaluation book, which looked at and emphasized understanding interrelationships, multiple perspectives, and boundary choices. And these systems concepts were used by the Topical Interest Group of the American Evaluation Association to articulate principles for effective use of systems thinking, interrelationships, perspectives, boundaries, and dynamics, each of which were conceptualized for taking into account in designing, implementing, and using an evaluation. Mike Jackson has offered critical systems practice as an alternative to systems concepts. He offers five systemic perspectives that he believes have the capacity to provide significant impact in the complex problem situations. The machine perspective, looking at traditional goal attainment, the organism perspective, how systems are functioning, cultural political considerations, societal environmental considerations, and interrelationships. Again, a different set of conceptualizations put together into a conceptual framework that becomes an approach. The attention to systems has led not only to evaluating systems change, but now to evaluating systems transformation. As we face a climate emergency, as we face a pandemic, as we face growing inequities in the world, the challenge has become to evaluate systems transformation. And the International Development Evaluation Association in Prague in 2019 created and passed the Prague Declaration on Evaluation for Transformational Change that took the position that all evaluations should address Sustainability, another important outcome concept. The Sustainable Development Goals articulated and adopted in 2015 for the period 2015 to 2030 is a conceptual framework of a transformative agenda that includes 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And those Sustainable Development Goals each represents a conceptualization of a development priority. They can be grouped in different ways. The Stockholm Resilience Center grouped them into categories of the biosphere, societal SDGs, economic SDGs, and the overall coordination SDGs. A conceptualization, a conceptual framework of the SDGs, emphasizing their interconnectedness, not just discrete silos, each autonomous, but the relationships among the SDGs as itself a conceptual framework. And so transformation has become a different way of understanding the challenges of the world beyond where evaluation began in doing project evaluation, where project goals attain programs, how effective were they? We're now talking about transforming systems and conceptual frameworks like this one have emerged to deal with the multiple dimensions of transformation. So as we're talking about concepts, let me, before going into further specific concepts, deal with the nature of conceptual variation itself. It can be useful to distinguish sensitizing concepts from operational concepts. A sensitizing concept raises consciousness about something and alerts us to watch out for it within a specific context. But it doesn't tell us what we ought to think about that thing. It doesn't provide a definition. It's a concept basket that allows us to gather different perspectives on the concept. Herbert Bloomer introduced this notion as a way of looking anthropologically, uh, ethnomethodologically, at how different people use different words and what they mean by those words. In contrast, quantitative data looks to operationalize and measure uh, concepts. And so operational concepts have clear, specific, and measurable dimensions, whereas sensitizing concepts offer diverse perspectives and contextual variations and individualized meanings without operationally defining the concept. Both have value. They serve different kinds of purposes. They're different ways of dealing with concepts. You take something like excellence. That can be defined operationally for what it means 
within a different a particular context, or it can be left open to gather different understandings of what excellence means qualitatively. These are different ways of inquiring into concepts. So we're going to look at some singular concepts, beginning with context. Context is a concept that has become extremely important in evaluation, understanding the situation, the context within which an evaluation takes place. Context was the theme of the 2009 annual conference of the American Evaluation Association. And those who participated looking for operational definitions of context were disappointed because it remained largely a sensitizing concept, something that has to be defined and made sense of within a particular situation or context. Take accountability, for example. Um, a widely used term in evaluation, an important concept, an important approach and purpose of evaluation, the means by which an individual organization reports to recognize authority or authorities are held responsible for their actions. But to operationalize accountability, it has to be done within some specific meaning. In the reinventing government period of 1992, accountability became part of performance measurement with the mantra, what gets measured gets done. If you don't measure results, you can't tell success from failure. If you can't see success, you can't reward it. If you can't reward success, you're probably rewarding failure. Now notice success and failure become concepts linked to accountability. The mountain of accountability emerged as a way of defining accountability and applying it not just to outcomes and activities, but to basic management processes at the bottom, largely quantitative management information system data, accountability for impact in the middle of this mountain of accountability, which is most of traditional monitoring and evaluation, but the top of the mountain became close to the mission fulfillment involved accountability for learning, development, and adaptation. And you see the arrows along the left side taking the basic quantitative data and the program evaluation data and interpreting that within a learning, development, and adaptation uh, framework for accountability, which then on the right side feeds back down to the operational database. <clears throat> this is another example of how a major concept like accountability will take on different applications and purposes within the field of evaluation. Everything from a narrowly defined operational concept of what people in a program are responsible for, what the contract says they must deliver, what they must do, to the larger, more open notion of accountability as learning, development, and adaptation in conjunction with mission fulfillment. And that's a major message of our dealing with concepts, is that they do evolve, they have different applications at different times, they have different meanings, and so for any given situation in evaluation, we have to engage with the issue of what do those terms that we're using, what do the concepts we're using mean in this context. Evaluative thinking is another important concept. It's become very important in the last two decades. Partly as an example of process use, the ways in which people who go through an evaluation use the process to learn to think evaluatively. A entire issue of New Directions for Evaluation was devoted to evaluative thinking in 2018. We conceptualize three different forms of thinking, inductive, deductive, and abductive. But in a book on thought work that I edited with Elizabeth Minnick, a philosopher, we looked at how different fields undertake thinking in different ways. Strategic thinking, systemic thinking, entrepreneurial thinking, ethical thinking, philosophical thinking, evaluation. That led us to an inventory of thinking types where we added counterfactual thinking, comparative thinking, dialectical thinking, critical thinking, creative thinking with different purposes, 
looking across different disciplinary specializations, different uses of that kind of thinking, different thinking predilections and situations, and filled in the cells to create this inventory of thinking types. Here again is an example beginning with an overall concept, thinking, being thoughtful, and turning it into a specialization, evaluative thinking, looking at subtypes, inductive, deductive, abductive, and extending that into a conceptual framework that constitutes a typology of different thinking types. It's another example of inventory creation that reflects the evolution of a concept and the layering of a concept into different specialized applications. We turn then to another concept, cultural competence. The American Evaluation Association had a task force that worked for several years with the concept of cultural competence and in 2011 adopted a statement defining as a synthesizing concept what cultural competence is. More generic kinds of evaluation concepts are things like success. They can be evaluated using the success case method or failure. Engineers Without Borders began putting out failure reports on an annual basis from which they extracted lessons to apply to future work. Lessons is yet another example of a synthesizing concept. Here are two examples of major influential books about lessons. In Search of Excellence came out in 1979 as a set of seven lessons about excellence in the private sector. Lee Shore came out with a book that studied outstanding and effective anti-poverty programs for families and published that as a set of lessons. We've come to distinguish general lessons from high quality lessons and from lessons that are simply cognitive recommendations about what to do from lessons learned, which are behaviorally applied. It means a lesson that's been learned because it's being used. And we distinguished in utilization focused evaluation, general recommendation based lessons from high quality lessons that are triangulated, that are supported by research and theory, as well as evaluation findings and expert opinion staff knowledge. Books that report lessons like The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People are widely read in great demand. The world is hungry for knowledge that comes out of lessons and evaluation generates those kinds of lessons. Sometimes concepts are the focus of evaluation itself. So the MacArthur Foundation gives fellowships to people in the arts, who are organizers, who are social scientists and natural scientists, and the Chicago Tribune dubbed those awards the Genius Awards. And so the nature of genius, what these recipients experience by being labeled geniuses became a focus of evaluation. Another concept that can be evaluated is the idea of flow. Flow is where one is completely involved in an activity for its own sake. The ego falls away, time flies. Every action, movement, and thought follows inevitably from the previous one, like playing jazz. Michelle, she sent me high, said of flow, creating meaning involves bringing order to the contents of the mind by integrating one's actions into a unified flow experience. And so flow is something that can be evaluated as existing within an intense evaluation experience among those involved, or it can be a concept that applies to programs, to projects, to any collective experience or individual experience of intensity to understand the nature and dimensions of this concept called flow. Let's turn now again to some evaluation concepts that affect practice and theory. One of those is made in Africa evaluation. 
first formulated by Saleh Gariba of Africa. The idea was to draw upon African culture, African understandings, African perspectives in designing and conducting evaluations. An example of a principle or concept made in Africa is the principle of Mbutu from South Africa and Southern Africa, the spirit of interpersonal interaction that pervades Sub-Saharan Africa. It means a person is a person through other people. I am because of you. It's about the inter interdependence of people. And it's a concept that has influenced how African evaluators approach their work. Decolonizing evaluation is another concept that's become prominent in international development. Rodney Hobson has been a leader as part of culturally responsive evaluation in emphasizing decolonizing evaluation, along with colleagues around the world. He said at a recent AEA presentation, he's talking in, uh, a decade ago, a good friend and mentor chided me for advancing notions of decolonizing evaluation. He admonished my use of those concepts and thought that funders and clients would be off-put by the word decolonizing. Rodney says, it only occurred to me after he sat down next to me that he was issuing me a challenge to clarify how and why evaluation should serve in liberating and decolonizing ways. Surely, Rodney reflects, he could not be telling me not to use the terms, but to make clear why these liberating and decolonizing notions in the field would serve groups often marginalized and underrepresented. Rodney wrote about this in a 2014 volume of New Directions for Evaluation. And it's a powerful statement about when we use concepts, the importance of clarifying their context, their use, their importance, and elaborating how they improve and engage with evaluation issues. An example of another important evaluation concept is that of causal mechanisms, featured and elaborated by Ray Paulson and Nick Tilley as part of realistic evaluation. This is both a concept that has methodological and design uh, implications. Social networks are a concept that's taken on great importance. It had a volume of new directions devoted to it in 2006 and become even more important since then as a part of global networking. Technology is a concept that applies both to evaluation and to programs and interventions of other kinds. Here's an article from the Scandinavian Journal of Carrying Sciences about determination of the concept technology. The ontology of the concept as a component of the knowledge development in carrying science. A great example of looking at how technology interfaces with the work of a profession. In this case, the carrying sciences, in our case, evaluation science. Outliers, a very different kind of concept, but one that has both methodological and substantive influence on how we understand evaluation samples, who participates in the evaluation, and the implications of that participation. Now we're going to move from micro concepts like outliers to macro concepts like the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is a conceptual distinction that we are in a new geologic era. We've moved from the Holocene that we've been in as a species, as a planet for the last 12,000 years into a conceptually new era in the history of the Earth that is defined by the effects of human beings on the Earth more than the natural processes of planetary dynamics. And that's being called the Anthropocene. This is a cover of the magazine The Economist a couple years ago as the notion that we've moved into a new geologic phase became important. And that has implications for the larger context within which evaluations are conducted that we're going to turn to here shortly. So we've been dealing with some 
individual concepts like context. We've looked at contextual uh, variations of typologies like different forms of evaluative thinking. Um, and now we're going to look at some layered concepts where a concept has dimensions within it, building on that notion of the way in which a concept at a broad level begins to become more specialized as we unpeel the onion and get deep inside it. So bodies of knowledge begins as a disciplinary body of knowledge, but then we've come to talk about multidisciplinary forms of knowledge, cross-disciplinary forms of knowledge, interdisciplinary forms of knowledge, and transdisciplinary forms of knowledge, which is what Michael Scriven has described evaluation as, a transdiscipline. It cuts across all the other disciplines, like statistics cuts across all the disciplines, logic cuts across all disciplines. Evaluation is used in every discipline. Um, it's the way that you judge peer review articles. It's the way that you judge what's worth knowing and what's not worth knowing, what constitutes quality research, what constitutes important findings. And that makes evaluation transdisciplinary. Um, you take a concept like validity, and that has multiple layered dimensions, construct validity, content validity, concurrent validity, predictive validity, consequential validity, face validity, internal validity, external validity, convergent, discriminant, nomological, criterion validity, becomes a layered concept that you have to dig down into to look at its multiple meanings. Validity versus reliability is a way of looking at the quality of measurement and of methods that are used. Evaluating the validity and reliability of research data and of evaluation data becomes a layered approach to design and data quality. Mixed methods as opposed to multiple methods. So we have studies that have a single method, multiple methods, mixed methods, sequential methods, integrated methods, triangulated methods, visual data, data visualization. Stephanie Evergreen being our leading conceptualizer of data visualization and its implications, ways of going about doing it, but it begins with the concept that data visualization is a thing, that we need to grasp it, that we need to deal with it. And she has produced two major books about this, a volume she co-edited of New Directions about this, and others in the field have become part of this larger issue of visual methodologies, including data visualization. Concept mapping itself is both an idea and a method. Concept uh, <clears throat> mapping developed by Bill Trochin at Cornell and his colleagues is a way of taking the interview data from people about what's important to them in a program experience or program outcomes and mapping the concepts that come out of that qualitative data. It's a form of analysis. Efficiency concepts can be layered from cost analysis to cost effectiveness, cost benefit, value for money, return on investment, true cost accounting and full cost accounting that move beyond simple input output. For example, in agriculture, the fertilizer and uh, pesticides and the yield as a input output system to true cost accounting looks at the effects of agriculture on the land, on the environment, on a culture, on gender equity, on other related social and environmental issues. And that's what's called true cost and full cost accounting. So again, we're looking at how broader concepts can be layered into some specific different meanings. Triangulation, looking at multiple diverse data sources, different uh, perspectives on how to interpret data is an important way of understanding the quality of findings. Reflexivity refers to the ways in which we come to understand how we fit in as evaluators 
into the culture of inquiry that we're a part of. And reflexivity has us to look at how our own culture as evaluators that we are come out of our age, gender, class, social status, education, political practice, language, values, our preferred concepts affect how we go about evaluation and it invites us to ask questions about ourselves here at the bottom of this triangle. What do I know? How do I know what I know? To ask questions about those studies. How do they know what they know? What shapes and has shaped their worldview? And ask those for whom the evaluation is going to be done, the audience or the intended users of the evaluation. How do they make sense of what we give them? What do they bring to the findings we offer? This is a form of triangulated reflexivity, an important conceptual idea, both methodologically and substantively. A relatively new concept is the idea of the poly crisis, that we are in an era of multiple overlapping crises. The coronavirus pandemic, the epidemic of misinformation on social media and in political ideologies, unsustainable food systems and increased hunger, economic and political turbulence, the climate emergency, growing in inequities and injustices, that these each of these crises by themselves is a part of a larger system of poly crisis. These crises intersect, affect each other, are mutually reinforcing. The poly crisis provides a context for how global interventions are shaped and therefore how evaluation of those global interventions is undertaken. Which brings us then to consider a different set of concepts, what I've come to call conceptual dualities. Conceptual dualities are concepts that are linked together in a kind of yin-yang sense. There are certain concepts that, that constitute a continuum or a set of opposites that require the evaluation to position itself in relationship to those concepts. I'm just going to list some common examples by way of illustrating what conceptual dualities are. For example, the relationship between accountability and learning, or independence and interdependence. Attribution analysis versus contribution analysis. Evaluator control versus a collaborative engagement approach to evaluation. Generalizing versus contextualizing. A neutral stance by the evaluator in contrast to having skin in the game and sharing the values of the program. A project focus for evaluation versus, as we've talked about earlier in this video, a systems focus. There are a number of these conceptual dualities. One that is taking on increasing importance is the relationship between the local and the global in what's come to be called conceptually global, a combination of local and global. So that for any given evaluation, you understand what's happening local and how that's affected by global trends. And for those evaluations that are focusing on global interventions, how that plays out in the local sense. This involves zooming in and zooming out, zooming in for the local understanding and zooming out to get the big picture of what's going on. I turn now to evolving concepts. Concepts are not stagnant. They get introduced, they begin to get used. As more people use them, they take on nuances of meaning, they get applied in different situations. And so a part of dealing with conceptual realities is the realities of how concepts evolve and their meanings change. Let's look at examples. Statistical significance and substantive significance two major ways of understanding how we interpret data. And both are important. Um, statistical significance is based strictly on p-values. Substantive significance is based on our knowledge of the world, what, how we make sense of what's important. But the American statistician in a special volume in 2019 entitled Moving to a World Beyond P Less Than 0.05 recommended banning the term statistically significant. In that journal article, they editorially said, 
don't say, quote, statistically significant. Regardless of whether it was ever useful, a declaration of statistical significance has today become meaningless. It has evolved. They recommend instead what they call Adam. We summarize our recommendations in two sentences, totaling seven words, represented by the mnemonic Adam. Accept uncertainty, be thoughtful, open, and modest. Remember Adam. What they're reacting to is the mechanistic way in which statistical significance has evolved, and they want people to think. Accept uncertainty, be thoughtful. And they conclude the editorial article by saying, the initial slow speed of progress should not be discouraging. That is how all broad-based social movements move forward, and we should be playing the long game. But the ball is rolling downhill. The current generation is inspired and impatient to carry this forward. So let's do it, the article continues. Let's move beyond, quote, statistically significant, close quote, even if upheaval and disruption are inevitable for the time being. It's worth it. In a world beyond P less than 0.05, by breaking free from the bonds of statistical significance, statistics in science and policy will become more significant than ever. And we can add that they will become more significant in the field of evaluation as well. The principles of accept uncertainty, be thoughtful, be open, be modest, emerge and evolve to replace mechanistic statistical significance. Or in a more dramatic movement towards systems change, interocular significance, significance that hits you between the eyes, where the results are palpable, clear, and understood and well-documented by those involved. Now we come to evaluator stance concepts, one of the most powerful of which is speaking truth to power, which was the theme of the 2018 American Evaluation Association Conference. Truth, the notion that we have findings that are worth paying attention to, that shed insights into reality, and that we speak that truth hopefully in a way that can be heard. Truth speaking principles include three levels, speaking truth to power, empowering, giving voice to the voiceless, those whose truth is not typically heard by the powerful, and speaking truth to each other. Truth becomes an intervention. In the truth and reconciliation process in South Africa, Bishop Tutu and Nelson Mandela created a process where truth became an intervention toward reconciliation, following five principles of bringing the together the oppressor and the oppressed, speaking truth about what had occurred, confession, forgiveness, and reconciliation. But we live in a time where distinguishing truth from bullshit is a challenge, a post-truth era in which facts are in doubt. Post-truth relates to or denotes circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. And so evaluators are part of that struggle on the side of facts, evidence, truth, data, reality, thinking, all of which are truth concepts, versus post-truth concepts of fake news, alternative facts, make-believe, groupthink, distortions, and outright lying. Shouting truth to really be heard has become moving to the level beyond just speaking truth. Additional evaluator stance concepts include recognizing that we have skin in the game, where the future of humanity is at stake because of the global warming crisis, because of the poly crises intersecting challenges, that we come to those programs with skin in the game. It matters how those results turn out to affect more effectiveness among programs. And we have soul in the game. The notion that we get involved in things that we care about. And so the stance of evaluators from neutrality and independence to having skin in the game and soul in the game is one of the ways in which the stance of evaluators are evolving controversially and conceptually. 
Now I'm going to go a different way. We've looked at, at some singular concepts. We've looked at conceptual dualities. Now we're going to look at some triads of concepts. The rule of three refers to an observation by Seville Kushner about the extent to which our mental models focus on the notion that within any given setting, there are people who are above average, average, and below average. The very notion of average, the concept of an average, is a deeply embedded way of thinking about the world. Then we've got perspectives on long-term, medium-term, and short-term, and the challenge of dealing with those different levels in our modeling and evaluations. There's single loop learning, double loop learning, and triple loop learning. There's collaborative, participatory, and empowerment approaches that all involve engaging with stakeholders, but in varying degrees and in various ways. Collaboration becomes both a way of engaging in evaluation, but also building capacity, another important concept in evaluation. And Liliana Rodriguez Campos, as a uh, one of the leaders in the Collaborative Evaluation Topical Interest Group of the American Evaluation Association, has created a model for collaborative evaluations and translated those into French and Spanish and multiple languages so that they would have more access as we do evaluation in a global world. The learning process can be conceptualized as a triad. Knowledge, competence, confidence are various levels of outcomes in learning. Risk assessment is another triad. The risk that there is a good idea or a bad idea, the risk of implementation can be good or bad, and how high quality the evidence is to assess both ideas and implementation. DEI has become a major triad for evaluation that looks at diversity, equity, and inclusion and is part of the Equitable Evaluation Initiative that calls for all evaluations to address equity. A particularly intriguing triad conceptually is Aristotle's distinction between truth, beauty, and justice. Evaluation pioneer and philosopher Ernie House has treated truth, beauty, and justice in evaluation as follows. Truth is the attainment of arguments soundly made, beauty is the attainment of coherence well wrought, and justice is the attainment of politics fairly done. Truth, beauty, and justice. Worth repeating, truth is the attainment of arguments soundly made, Beauty is the attainment of coherence well wrought, and justice is the attainment of politics fairly done. Jane Davidson took those concepts and suggests that creating a clear, compelling, and coherent, beautiful evaluation story is the key to unlocking validity, truth, and fairness, justice. Here is a lovely example and a powerful example of playing with concepts, taking concepts from elsewhere, in this case out of Greek philosophy, and looking at their relevance and application in contemporary evaluation. Okay, we've looked at single concepts like context and polycrisis and conceptual dualities like learning and accountability. We've looked at triads uh, conceptually, average, above average, below average. And now we're going to look at some conceptual quadrants. Plan, do, check, and act is a common framework that has evaluation implications at each stage. In considering the nature of knowledge, we have different ologies, ontology, epistemology, axiology, and methodology. Situational concept quadrants, like systemic change versus context-specific change, and gradual or adaptive change versus continuous or disruptive change, creates a Snowden's Kinefen framework is a four quadrant framework that distinguishes simple, complicated, complex, and chaotic situations. And these various quadrants have implications for 
what the situation is, and then how evaluation would respond to those situations, where the nature of the evaluation design and the evaluation approach has to be made consistent with the situation that is faced. So we turn from there to some process concepts. Process concepts concern ways of conceptualizing how evaluation is done. In utilization-focused evaluation, we emphasize working with primary intended users in what I've called the adaptive cycle, beginning by acting, then reacting, interacting, and adapting to the primary intended users that you're working with. The acting that begins that is laying out the commitment to use and the options that are available, and then reacting to their responses, interacting with them about what those options are, and adapting the evaluation to shared understandings. There are stakeholder analysis grids that have a quadrant between low and high power stakeholders, low and high interest stakeholders. And this framework allows one to distinguish the different roles that stakeholders may play in an evaluation as a form of situation analysis conceptually. So just a couple more frames. We've done single concepts, conceptual dualities, threes, quadrants. Let's close out with pentagons and hexagons. A pentagon framework, the guide framework for doing principles-focused evaluation, has five concepts that a principle ought to be guiding, useful, inspiring, developmental, and evaluable. And each of these is important in doing principles-focused evaluation. The American Evaluation Association worked for several years in articulating evaluator competencies and came up with five conceptual categories for evaluator competencies, professional practice, methodology, context, planning and management, and interpersonal skills. In a framework for strategic development and adaptation to COVID, the World Food Program generated five types of strategic impacts in response to COVID things they maintained, things they expanded, innovations that occurred, pivots that were made, and things that were stopped. Maslow's hierarchy is five levels of human needs, from physiological needs to safety needs to belonging and love needs to esteem needs, and finally, self-actualization needs. There's a five-factor model about how people engage with new experiences, their openness, their conscientiousness about those, how extroverted they may be, how agreeable they may be, how neurotic they may be. There are low and high scores on these various dimensions. In the original Organizational for Economic Cooperation and Development, DAC criteria, evaluations were supposed to demonstrate relevance, effectiveness, efficiency, impact, coherence, and sustainability. And there are hexagonal conceptual frameworks. The OEC DAC criteria revision process added coherence to the original five, so that there are now six DAC criteria for international development. The Bloom's taxonomy that I opened with is six levels of understanding that comes out of teaching and learning. The water systems change framework is six categories on three layers. To bring about major system change, you need structural change in policies, practices, and resource flows, relational change in connections and power dynamics, and mental model changes to create transformational change. A six frame. So what's this all about? How do we make sense of this extended riff, this stream of consciousness about concepts? I'm going to share 12 observations just as a way of stimulating your own further reflections on the nature of concepts and their role in our work and in our lives. One, we think in concepts and can't think without concepts. Our heuristics, our information processes, the way our brains work, we are concept dependent. Evaluation as a field then is both conceptually and methodologically based and driven. We tend to think of the field as primarily about methods, but concepts determine methods. 
and concepts are the building blocks for evaluation theory and the variety of approaches that exist. They're all concept-based. Concepts generate inquiry questions, which become evaluation designs and measurements. It all begins with a concept. Concepts provide a framework for interpreting, making sense of, and presenting findings. Six, concepts are expressed and framed in a variety of ways, from single concepts to multi-dimensional frameworks that can take the form of typologies and taxonomies. And we've reviewed a number of those, but barely touched the surface of how many there are. There are hundreds of concepts and conceptual frameworks. This video was meant to be like a wine tasting to give you a sense of that variety and its importance. And concepts can be layered. So we've looked at some overarching concepts like use that then have a number of specific kinds of use as concepts within them. And concepts evolve so that our understanding, uses of, nature of concepts develop over time. As we use them, as they take on different meanings, concepts have to be applied and interpreted contextually. They aren't absolute or generic in a multidimensional, diverse world. Concepts are deeply embedded in our thought processes, often beyond our awareness. So another purpose of this video was to invite you to think about surface, raise to consciousness, mindfulness, and awareness, the concepts that guide your thinking. Concepts open doors to understanding, even as they narrow vision, a two-edged sword. And finally, concepts are social constructions of reality. The map concept is not the territory. Know the difference. Concepts give us in frames that we need to approach our understanding of how the world is, but it is not the world. The author Meglin Ogilblin, author of God, Human, Animal, Machine, subtitled Technology, Metaphor, and the Search for Meaning, has written, quote, the purity of any abstract concept becomes brittle and untenable when imposed upon the complexity of the waking life, close quote. The purity of any abstract concept becomes brittle and untenable when imposed upon the complexity of the waking life. We might do well then in remembering the principles offered by the American statistician in banning the concept statistical significance. They offered four principles for making sense of the world. Accept uncertainty, be thoughtful, be open, and be modest. In that spirit, I leave you with these inquiry questions about the role of concepts in your work and professional life. What are the concepts that are important to you? that you draw on to think about how you do what you do. What concepts are you not using? What concepts are so deeply embedded that you have to work to bring them into consciousness? What concepts are important to the people you work with? How do you make your concepts vibrant and meaningful so that they provide the direction that makes a difference in all that you do?